another three weeks. Because today is the halfway point. We started on a Wednesday. We're going to end on a Wednesday. And this is kind of, we're half done. All day. And I'm still putting the right place. of how you score because I want to see how people do using that system. And this time I went through and I picked the questions so that they're minimally confusing because of the terminology they use. They use some slightly different terminology than we do, but it's only very slight. So I kind of like this lecture today, mostly because I made it up and it's not in the book. But um, because it's really kind of chemistry as opposed to the foundation. So, this is how to write a chemical formula. I call it Bob's folding method for ionic compounds. We'll talk a little bit about molecular compounds as well. So, if you ever gone bowling and kept score, this looks a lot like the little bowling scorecard. If you don't know anything about bowling or keeping score in bowling, then just think of it as Bob's boxes. So this is what I start with, the bowling scorecard. And this is the reason why. When we're dealing with ionic compounds, it has two halves. It has a cation portion positively charged ion, and it has an anion portion, negatively charged ion. The positively charged portion can be monoatomic, a metal cation. It can be a non-metal cation. We won't talk too much about those. Or a polyatomic cation, more than one element. And the only one that I consider is the ammonium ion. It's the only polyatomic cation that we're going to talk about. There's a couple of others, uh, <coughs> but we're not going to deal with those. The anion portion, that uh, negatively charged ion portion, also can be monoatomic, a nonmetal. It can be a semi-metal anion or a polyatomic anion. What you'll find is a lot of polyatomic anions in the compounds that we're going to be using for the next couple of weeks. So that's what makes it up. 
Now, each of the each of the ions, the positively charged half and the negatively charged half, have two things. They have a formula, symbol or formula, and a charge. I write the name of the compound underneath. We look up the formula and the charge and the inside back cover of the book. Similarly with the anion formula, it has, uh, the anion portion has a formula and it has a charge, an electrical charge. Now in order to become a cation and have a positive charge, the ion has to lose electrons. The element loses electrons to become an ion, a positively charged ion. It doesn't gain protons, because that would make it a different element. So the element gains electron or loses electrons to become a cation. Similarly, an element come on. Gains. gains electrons to become an anion. Gains electrons, so it has more electrons than protons, net negative charge, loses electrons, net positive charge become a cation. When we start doing equations, there's a place for the physical state of the compound. It can be a solid, a liquid, a gas, or an aqueous solution. When I ask you to balance equations, I'm going to state in the question what the physical state is. That goes in parentheses after the formula of the compound. So if I say a solution of sodium chloride, the physical state would be the letters AQ. Remember that from yesterday? Uh, if I say solid uh, barium sulfate, is added to, then the physical state is solid. If one of the products is water, it's going to be a liquid. And if one of the products is carbon dioxide or oxygen gas, it'll be a little G or gas for the physical state. And we'll go over that again. Actually, we'll go over all of this again next week after the exam when we start doing writing and balancing equations. I'll go over that lecture. will look a lot like this lecture for the first half, because I'm going to go over all of this again, because we don't want to forget this. So actually, we were just, we were noting in the beginning that today is like the halfway point. We're like half done now. This is the, whatever, fourth Wednesday. We're, we've been here for, Three weeks we're going to be here for another three. Half done. A lot faster than the 16 weeks for sure. But we're covering the same material. Alright, so for example, and I might give you the stock name of a compound, or I might give you the Latin name of a compound. So, lead to sulfate, or plumbus sulfate. Same thing, different names. Latin name, stock name. The, you might want to make a note, for the sapling homework, they don't call it the Latin name, they call it the old name. And they don't call it the stock name, they call it the systematic name. Meaning the IUPAC system of nomenclature. So they don't call it stock, they call it systematic, they don't call it Latin, they call it old. But it means the same thing. Old is Latin, stock is the element with the charge. So, we look up lead 2 in the back of our book, the inside cover, and we see that the symbol is PB for lead and lead 2, the cation charge is plus 2. 
we look up sulfate ion in the polyatomic anion chart, and we see that its formula is SO4, and it has a charge of minus 2. Now, the important thing here in determining the formula is that the net charge for the compound is equal to zero. You have to have the same amount of plus charge as minus charge. In this case, very nice, plus two and minus two adds to zero. We don't have to do anything. I filled in a physical state as solid because I happen to know that lead sulfate is insoluble. So if this was the product of a chemical reaction, it would be a solid in the bottom of the reaction vessel. Or if it were the starting material, it would also be a solid. We would measure it out of a jar that said lead sulfate on it. Okay, so far? So I'm going to summarize this with a six-step method. But let's take a different version of lead sulfate, because lead has two different cations. It had the plus two that we just had up. It also has plus four. So the stock name is lead four sulfate which has the Latin name plumbic sulfate, the lead has a charge of plus four. Lead ion plus four, sulfate is still minus two. Well, the net charge is not zero because plus four and minus two don't add up to zero. So we have to do something. We need two sulfates because two times a minus two gives us minus four. And when we have a polyatomic ion, whether it's an anion or a cation, and we have more than one of them, we need to put parentheses down. Two minus twos minus four, one lead plus four. Now this adds to zero. And that's what we're looking for because in order to be a compound, it must be electrically neutral. The charge of the anion piece plus the charge of the cation piece must equal zero. Or it's still an ion. It's not a compound. All right. A little bit about subscripts, because we're going to uh, encounter this not only with the formulas, but when we get to balancing equations as well. Subscripts always refer to the entity immediately preceding the number. So sulfate, SO4, this means four oxygen, because the oxygen immediately precedes the number. Only the oxygen, not the sulfur. A sulfate ion has one sulfur atom and four oxygen atoms. It has a net charge of minus two. The subscript two refers to everything within the parentheses because that's the entity immediately preceding the number. So, in lead sulfate, there's one lead atom, two sulfur atoms, and eight oxygen atoms. 
2 times 4, 2 times 1, and just 1. This 2 does not refer to the lead. That, if we had more than one lead, the subscript would be here before the parentheses.
And in this case, I have to determine the least common denominator. Do you remember what that is for math? The least common multiplier, the least common product between 3 plus 3 and minus 2, or 3 and 2, is 6. So I need two aluminums times plus 3 to give the cation part of the formula a charge of plus 6, 2 times plus 3. And the carbonate piece, I need three carbonates. I need to put the parentheses in because it's a polyatomic anion and I have more than one of them, times a minus 2 to get a minus 6. That is the, that is the simplest way to get the plus, the cation and anion pieces to add to zero. Sometimes when it's like this, I'll point out that those numbers seem to be the same. And those numbers seem to be the same. So I call it the switching method. But if you don't remember least common denominator, uh, it's six, three and two, it's six. You can flip flop the charge and the subscript. The charge here will match the subscript here, and the charge here will match the subscript here. The only thing you need to be cautious about when you do that is that what the result is, is the simplest unit formula. In other words, if I had I remember the example now, and I'm going to go back to it. If we had lead four sulfate, and I didn't just say, okay, Two times two minus two is minus four plus four equals zero. If I did the switch method, not be the right formula for lead for sulfate. <coughs> the reason is that it is not the sim simplest ratio. You end up with 2 to 4, which is the same as 1 to 2. And if you wrote PB2SO4, 4, that would be the wrong formula. So this works when you have to actually apply the least common denominator when you're going to multiply both sides by something in order to get it to add to zero. If you do it all the time, sooner or later you're going to get a formula that is not the simplest representation. So you have to check that and see that, well, if that's two and that's four, that really needs to be one to two. So, J 
just as a caution if you make a rule out of the switching. Magnesium to nitrate. I look it up. Again, I don't have to give you that. This is only one um, form of that magnesium cation. You look it up in the back of the book, it says magnesium is Mg, it's plus two. You look up nitrate, and you see that it's NO3, and it's minus one. So we're going to need two of these. So that this becomes minus two plus two. Electrically neutral. And these nitrate Mg NO3 taken twice. We need parentheses because the polyatomic ion, and we have more than one of them. I know I keep saying that. I have good reason to say it, because I have graded a lot of exams. And I get parentheses all over the place. So, six steps to determine the chemical formula of an ionic compound, given the name of the compound and the physical state. Step one, draw the boxes. Oh, reactants and products. Why? That seems to You see where I took this one from? Something balancing. Draw the boxes. Period. Draw the boxes. First, draw the boxes. We're only dealing with one compound at a time here. Then, step two, write the name of the compound under the box. So the name is in the question. You just write it under the box. The challenge is for you to actually write the same thing that's in the question under the box. You think, not very challenging until it's on a test, and then all of a sudden A's become I's. It's amazing. Three, step three, fill in the physical state if it's given in the question. If it's not, leave it blank. Four, go to the inside back cover of your book to the tables and determine the symbol and the charge for each of the pieces, for the anion piece and the cation piece. Five, write those formulas in the big box and write the charges in the small box for each compound, just the way it is in the book. So, so far, we've done five of the six steps. All we've done is draw some boxes read some stuff, and copy that stuff. So reading and copying, first five steps. I'm confident that everybody in this room is totally capable of doing that repetitively. Please don't prove me wrong. 
the sixth step, the last step, is to balance the charge of the cation anion parts of the compound, adding subscript multipliers to ensure that the compound has the compound has a net charge of zero. Use parentheses around the polyatomic ions only when the multiplier, the subscript multiplier, is more than one. If it's one, you don't have to use parentheses. 